If you're a professional brewer, you know how frustrating it can be when you go to place a yeast order and what you're looking for is out of stock. Well, Imperial Yeast is here to help by guaranteeing that commercial orders up to 20 liters of 10, yes, 10 of their most popular strains will ship free if they're not in stock when you place your order. Some of these strains include A38 Juice for those hazy IPAs, A07 Flagship, a classic in clean American styles, L13 Global, which is said to be one of the world's most popular lager strains, A44 Kviking for your warm fermented beers, and so many more. So in addition to pitching right with the highest quality yeast on the market, they're promising that yeast will be ready when you need it or shipping is on them. Whether you're a pro or a home brewer, if you haven't tried Imperial Yeast in your brewery, it's time to up your game. You can check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and place your commercial orders at imperialyeast.com. Hey everybody, you are listening to the 340th episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast, which means it is time for another Brew and A. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and today I'm joined by contributor and host of the Brewlosophy Show, Martin Keene, to answer a bunch of questions submitted by listeners of the show. This is something we do every 10th episode. Marshall, I think we should just acknowledge how you are able to sort of casually include outrageous puns in, in all of these episodes. I mean, this is brew and A instead of Q&A. You know, just before coming on, I was writing my script for The Philosophy Show, and I'm writing about an experiment that I did, and I'm just typing experiment instead of experiment, and as though that is a completely normal thing to do. <laughs> I, well, and it's funny because the whole XBMT thing has come up quite a few times over the years. Uh, that was sort of a happy accident that Ray found. Uh, our, one of our first contributors on the crew uh, came up with as just a shortened, easier way to write experiment. So it is pronounced experiment. Uh, we just do that as kind of our own, you know, branded sort of way of putting it. So uh, it's and it's been around for a long time now. But yes, I do enjoy the puns, as you uh, pointed out. And I always enjoy doing these episodes as well. I look forward to digging into some of the interesting listener submitted questions with you today, Martin. All right. If you're a fan of this show, we would love for you to consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy, which you can do over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Coming up later this month, July of 2024, brewing and beer steward instructor at Dakota County Technical College in Rosemont, Minnesota, Andrew Burns will be taking questions from patrons. In addition to his vast experience in both home and professional brewing, Andrew has been a guest on the Brew Lab podcast where he discussed the various options for acquiring a brewing education, which all of us here at Brewlosophy agree is very important, especially for those who have any interest in going pro. Andrew's going to be hanging out with patrons on Saturday, July 27th, 2024, so make sure to make your pledge of just $3 or more by Friday the 26th. All past sessions are stored on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Learn more about all of the rewards we offer for your support and become a patron today over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to help us out is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when you're shopping online. Your shopping experience doesn't change at all, and we get a little kickback for that referral. You can even bookmark those links to make it easier to access. Finally, if you wouldn't mind, please take a few seconds to leave a rating and review of this show in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts as it helps those who may not be familiar with us to more easily find the show massive thanks to everybody who has already taken the time to do this Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who are known for their incredible all-in-one electric brewing systems. I've brewed on both their 120 and 240 volt systems, and I'm telling you, these things are legit, efficient, easy to use with a relatively small footprint. You're not going to be disappointed with one of these units. Plus, the guys behind the company run an awesome YouTube channel, which you can find by searching YouTube for Clawhammer Supply. If you're in the market for electric brewing gear or even just reasonably priced kettles and such, make sure to check out what Clawhammer Supply has to offer at clawhammersupply.com. And don't forget to let them know Brulosophy sent you when you're checking out. That's clawhammersupply.com. Listener Lee Cox wrote in with some general feedback. He says, I really enjoy the podcast. I've been homebrewing for about 10 years. Sometimes I feel like a beginner and other times I feel like I have a real handle on things. I've been drinking craft beers for maybe 35 years or so. At any rate, I realized that over time, my tastes have changed quite a bit. When I first started drinking craft beer, my favorites by far were stout. Uh, then I became a real IPA fanatic. I'm still not into the hazies, he says. But lately, although I haven't lost my love for those styles, I've become much more interested in well-made lager, cold 
Kolsch, Blondale, etc. I wonder how many people have had a similar change in taste. It certainly opens up a lot more brewing options. Isn't that funny how how often we hear that? And Lee, I'm, I'm totally with you here. So when I started brewing, I was trying to brew the most outrageous saisons that I could do. And then, you know, everything Belgian. And the, the more yeast character I could get, the better. And then eventually, yeah, there's just some, something to be said for a, a clean, crisp lager. And I think if you talk to most of the Brewlosophy contributors who've all been brewing for a good amount of time, one of one of their favorite styles does seem to be pale fizzy lager, right? <laughs> That's so true. It's most uh, beer drinkers that I know who have been drinking for any amount of time. Uh, a few years ago, someone actually posted a meme on social media that sort of poked fun at this apparent trend among beer drinkers to start with basic lagers before moving into more robust styles like stout and IPA. Even uh, and then uh, you know eventually like drifting back toward these more standard log- lager styles. I'd be lying if I said that's not exactly what happened to me as well, uh, Martin. I mean, every I, I never really lost my love for clean, crisp pale lagers, but I certainly went through this period where, kind of like you, it, it, they weren't really a priority for me. I was more focused on on yeast forward beers or sour beers or hoppy beers. Though these days, uh, my my biggest preference is for just something pale, simple, fizzy, yellow, crisp, and refreshing. Uh, I don't even care if it comes in a can from a big you know brewing brewing company that's been around for hundreds of years so good to know we are not alone thank you so much for the email lee if you have show feedback you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or leave us a note on social media all righty when we return from this break answers to your questions After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort, from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature, in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Thanks so much to everybody who submitted questions to us. These episodes wouldn't be possible without you. So we're going to get uh, this one kicked off with a question. It's actually two questions sent in by listener Nathan Cherry from Walkerville, Victoria, Australia. His first question, Nathan says, I brew 84 liter or these are about 22 gallon batches to fill four standard corny kegs. Due to the size of my system, I have a pulley set up above the kettle to remove the grain basket after the mash and I leave it suspended after sparging to let the basket drip into the kettle during the ramp up and boil. I've had to reduce the sparge volume as it makes quite a difference, but I generally I generally work towards a standard boil volume so I can remove the basket if it's getting too full. I assume there shouldn't be much of a risk of tannin extraction as I'm using less water, just adding additional time to the sparge process while it's running parallel with the boil. Do you see any issues with this? Martin, what do you think, man? Well, first of all, Nathan, it sounds like you have an absolutely wicked setup. An 84 liter, 22 gallon batches all brewing at once. That's that's crazy. Huge, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. I also use a pulley system, but I'm doing five gallon batches. And, you know, I, I, I pull that thing out and it's this soaked grain. It's so heavy and it's pretty precarious, just like hanging over my kettle. I cannot imagine 22 gallons of mash just like being pulled out like that. So... I'd love to see that. I know. <laughs> I know. And, and well, and he it's it's crazy to think I wonder what that basket looks like. I mean, I can kind of envision how big it is, but uh full of full of grain. I mean, you have to have some pretty strong supportive, you know, stainless in there to keep that basket from from just the or the grains from falling through that basket. But either way, uh to answer your que- your first question, Nathan, I personally don't see there being much of an issue with tannin extraction using the the approach you are. My I, I have tried. Now I have not brewed very much on um, 
uh, the fly sparge setups or, or what they also call continuous sparging. Um, I've done it a few times. Tannin extraction was never even a concern of mine just based on what we've come to understand about how tannins are extracted from the husks of grains, of barley grains. It really is mostly a function of pH. And when you over sparge, when you're, and which would mean kind of doing the opposite of what it sounds like you're doing, Nathan. When you over sparge is when you start to bump into that risk of extracting tannins. But I've talked to guys who've done it, you know, who've over sparged on purpose to try to get tannins, and that's not really where they're getting them from. The, the majority of the tannins I think we get from beer come from other additives, um, namely hops. So that that's where I'm at. I don't think you have to worry about it. Maybe maybe you differ with me on that one, Martin. No, I would, I would agree. I mean, I think the literature typically says tannins, you know, are going to be extracted at higher temperatures, so maybe 170 Fahrenheit, 77 C. So once you go above that, which you're not going to be doing, um, and then with high pHs, you know, a high pH above, say, 6, which again is probably above where you're going to be with your mash. So to me, that seems fine. I mean, the, the point there was you're using less water and then we're sort of adding it in during the boil. I don't know if there's any potential issue with hot bittering and a summarization by starting with a little bit less brewing liquid in the boil. Yeah. Um, you know, while it's kind of dripping down or not, I would be very surprised if it was. To me, this sounds like a pretty solid approach. Yeah. And I mean, we say this all the time, um, but if you're not perceiving tannins, which that's kind of what, you know, the concern about tannins are is that you're going to feel it in your mouth. You're going to feel that fuzziness on your tongue or that, that cinching up of your jowls. If you're not experiencing that, then you clearly don't have a, a big enough issue at least uh, to affect your perception of your beer. And that's what matters the most. So uh, if it, that, that's my, that's my response to one is I don't think it's an issue. If it were, you would probably taste it. And if you don't, I'd carry on doing what you're doing. It sounds like a great setup. Now, Nathan's second question, he says, I currently have a full fermenter of Vienna lager, Oh, baby. Uh, that's at 18C. That's around 64 Fahrenheit for a diacetyl rest. I plan to harvest the yeast from the bottom of the cone, and I'm looking for advice on using this in my next batch, an Australian lager with minimal mid or late hop additions. Should I be concerned enough about the flavor impact of repitching slurry from the darker beer? Do I need to make a starter? And what's the best way to determine the appropriate amount of slurry to use for my next 80 liter batch? Yeah. Now, uh, I spoke with Jordan folks, a uh, you know, productive contributor Jordan, about this very issue, about taking yeast from a darker batch and then putting it into a, a, a lighter batch. And we put out a, a Brodosophy Show episode describing how he does this process. And I think it really answers Nathan's question here pretty perfectly. So what Jordan did was he repitched yeast from a Czech dark lager into a Czech pale lager. And he did say that when he looked at the yeast slurry, it was noticeably darker coming out of that Czech dark lager. I mean, there's dark beer caught up in that and, and, and whatnot. But he did say that it didn't have any notable effect on the resulting beer. So the, the Czech pale lager that was repitched with that darker yeast slurry from the Czech dark lager, it didn't affect the color didn't affect the taste, it just came out as a typical clean Czech pale lager. So I think from that perspective, that's fine. I, I would be more concerned in this sort of situation if the first beer had been dry hopped, which is pretty unlikely in a Vienna lager, so I don't think that's an issue. The, the second part of Nathan's question, you know, how much yeast to use? Well, Jordan has a pretty good formula for this. So the way that he does it is he captures his yeast slurry in like a mason jar and then puts it in the fridge for a couple of days to settle. Um, that way, if there is still any liquid in that yeast slurry, it will rise to the top, the yeast will fall to the bottom, so you can just kind of discount, you can decant that. And what you're left with is a jar full of pure slurry. Now, there's a calculation as to, well, how many yeast cells do I have in my, in my jar of slurry here? And the formula you can use is for every one milliliter of pure yeast slurry in the jar, times that by two, and that gives you approximately the number of billion cells of yeast you have at maximum viability, which if this is coming straight out of a, a batch that's just finished, then it will be pretty much at maximum viability. So if you pull off, say, 200 milliliters of slurry, then you can say that's going to be about 400 billion viable yeast cells. So so based on knowing that, then you can just use your yeast calculation software, figure out how much you're going to need for this uh, for this Australian lager and base it on that. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to answer his last question first as well here, <laughs> just to go roll off of what you said. Uh, what I would recommend for determining the amount of slurry to use is go to your brew father calculator and it has a function for yeast slurry. Uh, so I that, that and, and here's the thing. 
we tend to obsess as home brewers. We tend to obsess about the the minutia. And uh, what I've come to absolutely you know accept about yeast is it is very forgiving. And as long as you're pitching around uh, the the amount that that you know is healthy that we know is going to work well, you're going to be fine. Um, so if you're a little under, if you're a little over, it's when you get massively under pitched, you know that that you start to have these issues. At least that's what what we've kind of come to determine based on our experimentation. Now on the experimentation, we have done quite a few experiments on <laughs> what we used to call sloppy slurry. And that just means unrinsed slurry. You know, it, it got 15 years ago or so before even I started doing the harvesting yeast from starters, um, which on a larger scale really is just brewing a small batch of beer and then reusing that yeast for another batch. So it's not f- too different than what we're already talking about here. Um, but the, all the talk was about rinsing yeast. People would, would, would wrongly refer to it as washing yeast, which involves acid and all of that stuff. But really just doing what, what Jordan was talking about, Martin, and, and taking that yeast, shaking it up, letting all of the good stuff fall to the bottom, decanting off the top, doing another shake, you know, and then you've got this nice pure yeast. Well, when we did that, or we took even fresh yeast and compared it to just straight slurry from, from various batches of beer, hoppy, malty, you know, high gravity, the, the, the yeast performs about the same and people typically are unable to tell those beers apart. So I don't think it's going to have any issue uh, or or any impact noticeably on your beer whatsoever, even in terms of color, Uh, that the amount of yeast you're pitching is relatively so small uh, in comparison to the batch of beer you're fermenting with it, especially if you're fermenting 84 liters, you know, of, of, of lager. uh, I think you're going to be just fine. Uh, There are far, far, there are many other things that I'd be far more concerned with. Now, do you need to make a starter? Uh, if you're if you're pitching, I, th- I think you touched on this, Martin. If you're pitching straight, you know, highly viable yeast, then you you really don't need a starter. If you want to, do a viability starter. You know, start one four or five hours ahead of time and pitch that just to get the yeast going. But even then, I don't think it's necessary because you've got this super healthy, highly viable yeast. So uh, again, just to just to kind of comment on your setup, Nathan, I appreciate the the questioning because it shows that you're open to influence and all of that. But it sounds like what you're doing is pretty legit my goodness sloppy slurry i'm adding that to my list of brewlosophy terms that's oh a, my that's word <laughs> <laughs> all right next question comes from philosophy patron adam reynolds i love this question because uh i had the exact same question and i was screwing this up royally so <laughs> adam asks he says i have a quality ph meter with automatic temperature compensation you often see that referred to as atc but i've heard that even with this i should cool the work before taking a measurement I've really gotten into monitoring my pH, but I really don't know what I'm doing. I've <laughs> taken a sample after about 10 minutes into the mash, put it into the fridge to cool down, which doesn't take too long. Then I test the pH. But he notes by that time I'm 20 minutes into the mash and making adjustments for a target pH does not seem linear. What are the best practices for measuring pH? Marsha, what do you think? Okay, so first off, I've got to put a disclaimer out there that I, un- unlike uh, Adam Reynolds, I I went the opposite direction. We did a whole bunch of experimentation on water chemistry, many of which focused specifically on mash pH. And what that led me to in my own personal life, and I've never recommended anybody follow my lead, is that I don't pay any attention to mash pH anymore uh, because... In every style of beer that I brewed on my system using the water that I have with the approach that I take, uh, there was very, it, it took quite a bit to really screw up the mash pH. My range, no matter what, was always fell between that 5.2 five, uh, five and 5.6. Five so I, I stopped paying attention to mash pH, but that doesn't mean I wasn't geeking out on it for a couple of years prior to letting it go. And what I found... Now, this was based on a recommendation, I believe it was from Palmer, actually, uh, that what I found to be the most consistent way to measure mash pH is by doing exactly what you're doing, Adam, is I would take a, a either a, sta- a little stainless cup that my my wife loves to have, like little dip cups uh, to keep uh, sauces away from for foods. Uh, and so we have these little stainless cups in my house. Well, stainless is, is going to chill things even faster. So I'd keep a couple of those in the freezer, take my, my um, wort samples from 
from the mash about 10 to 15 minutes into the mash, throw it back in the freezer for five minutes or so. And it was down to, you know, 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which the pH meter that I had, that's the the temperature that even though it has ATC, that's the temperature they recommend. And I, I you know, what I did find is that the ATC doesn't work that well. So I, I did a lot of testing out because I'm a geek uh, of taking, you know, 148 degree, 150 degree Fahrenheit uh, wort measuring that and then comparing it to the same exact wort, literally from the same cup that's been chilled down. And the, the there was always a small difference between them. So I, I always went the route you did, Adam, but I did so with the understanding that I'm not going to change or adjust my mash based on that reading. I'm going to use that uh, as data for my next batch. And I think that's where, uh, at least on the commercial scale, the friends that I know, that's typically th- when they're measuring match pH, it really is more a measure of their consistency to see if, hey, do I need to make changes in the next batch I make? Um, are there adjustments? And then also, what if you track mash pH and then something goes wrong with the beer, maybe you're not getting that crispness that you want or the opposite, you know, it's, it's, it's you're, you're not getting the warmth that, that nice bready thing that you want from the malt. Then, you know, you know what your mash pH is and you have a kind of a place to go f- to adjust in future batches. Um, I, I'm not sure of the, efficacy of adjusting your mash, you know, half an hour into it. I, I don't, I don't know if that, to me, that's kind of the opposite of, of aiming for consistency. Cause you don't really know what you're doing at that point. Uh, you're, or, or you know what you're doing. You're kind of going in blind. Cause are you going to take another mash reading and then only leave it for another half hour? Like what's the point of that? So that's, that's my take is when you're, when you're tracking your mash pH, it really isn't for the batch that you're brewing necessarily. It's so that you better understand uh, uh, more about that batch, but then you can make changes in the future. Yeah, totally. And I spoke to John Palmer about this whole thing for another Brewlosophy Show episode. Sorry for all the plugs here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he, he did tell me at the end, he said, you know, pH has an effect, but if you were to list the all, all of the things that are most important in the outcome of your beer, he said, I'm not sure I'd even put pH in my top 10. Yeah. So it, it's not necessarily super important. But you know, th- let's understand then how we could potentially improve on this process if you do want to track your, your pH. Because I had a fundamental misunderstanding of how automatic temperature compensation worked. I mean, I have a pH meter with ATC and I was like, great, I can just measure my wort at any temperature now and I can get the, the pH number, the pH number, right? So like an idiot, I would just like plunge it into the mash water and take a reading like, oh yeah, okay, 5.6, that sounds good. I'm on with my, you know, the rest of my brew day. But here's, here's how they actually work. So pH meters are typically calibrated at a particular temperature, and it's usually room temperature. So maybe like 20 C, 68 Fahrenheit, something like that. What ATC gives you is it lets you measure a sample at a different temperature than that calibrated temperature. So it gives you an accurate reading of the pH at that different temperature. So if I measure like something at 95 Fahrenheit instead of 68, it will calibrate for that and give me a pH reading 95 Fahrenheit. Now the issue here is that pH changes with temperature. So the optimal mash pH, I think most people agree, is somewhere between 5.2 and 5.6 pH. But the the key thing here is it's between 5.2 and 5.6 pH at room temperature. Higher temperatures will give a lower pH reading. So even if you took a beer that is at the correct range of 5.2 to 5.6 at room temperature, and you measure it at mash temperature, it would actually, with the ATC, give you a reading somewhere between 4.9 and 5.3. So you would be like, oh, my mash is a bit low. You know, my pH is a bit low here in my mash. Uh, and But it wouldn't be. So the recommendation is to always chill down to room temperature before taking a reading and then all of the guidance around mash pH is also assuming that you are at room temperature. Now, the way that I, I do this um, is I will take a little sample uh, from the mash and I'll put it into just a tiny little metallic cup that I have. And then I add a couple of whiskey scones to it. So whiskey stones are used uh, basically like ice cubes, but they don't melt. Uh, and I can just put three whiskey stones in my little metallic cup, give it a quick swirl around. And within a few seconds, I'm at 
pretty much room temperature. So it's a really quick way to do it. So if I do want to worry about pH in the current batch, I can chill it down, use my whiskey stones in you know, just a couple of seconds, then take my pH reading at room temperature and see if I'm in the right, the right pH level or not. Whiskey stones, that's a, such a genius idea if you're going to be doing uh, regular match pH readings because they're, they're not that expensive and they're not going to melt and, and dilute your, your uh, wort, you know. Um, and I, just to put a little bit of a, pra- a pragmatic spin on what Martin is talking about, let's say you are making a stout and you're including, as I would contend most brewers still do these days, you're including all of those roasted grains, which are highly acidic, relative to base malt, you're including all of those roasted grains in the full mash, okay? So you're you're brewing, you got it up at let's say 152 Fahrenheit, you pull off some sweet wort, you use your ATC pH meter to take a quick pH reading, and it shows that you're at 4.9. Well, you already knew, man, these roasted grains are going to pull that pH down. If it's at 4.9, I need to add some baking soda or some pickling lime or something basic to get in there and bump that up, except for... If you, if you were to measure that temperature at 68 degrees, it would be closer to 5.2. And this was, this was exactly the issue that I was having, Martin, that led me to realizing that my, uh, the buffering capacity of grain of the mash in general is just so strong that I really don't need to make adjustments on the fly like this. And what I found is that like, kind of like we're talking about is even with, uh, uh, really, you know, roasted, uh, batches, you know, roasted beers that I'm making where that, that pH is going to be pulled lower naturally because of the roasted grains or super pale batches like a 100% Pilsner malt, you know, uh, a Czech Pilsner. Um, what I would find is that, you know, if, and, and again, practical application, if you're taking a measurement at 150 degrees Fahrenheit of a all Pilsner malt malt bill, you know, it's going to be different than if you can, if you were or, or compared to a 68 degree Fahrenheit or 20 C pH reading. Uh, and that might, again, you're, you're going to be making adjustments in your head, trying to get this mash back to where it needs to be quote unquote, when really it probably is where it needs to be. So those are just things to be careful about. I, I, I'm with Palmer big time. I feel like people put way too much emphasis on mash pH because it sounds sciencey and that it, the more sciencey we sound, the better beer we're going to make, I guess. But uh, the, the truth of the matter is there's so many more things that are far more important than mash pH. And, and what we've come to find out is that, yeah, you know, you might eke a little bit more efficiency out, or, you know, extraction out of your mash if you nail your mash pH every single time which on a you know 70 barrel commercial scale amounts to more money in your pocket in the end for homebrewers, it doesn't even matter. So if there's no perceptible impact or or if there is a perceptible impact and it's just so small, nobody can taste it or very, very few people can. I that's again, I don't see the point in in investing too much energy in that side of it. Uh, but if, again, if you're trying to emulate a professional environment because you're kind of training yourself to go pro, then by all means, do it. Just make sure you're doing it right. Yep, t- totally agree with that. I mean, I used to add lactic acid to my batches if I didn't have much roasted grain in the, the malt bill. And then the the lactic acid ran out. I, I didn't buy any more and I kept brewing. And, you know, I, I would then come back and measure my pH again. I was often within that range. Anyway. That I was expecting <laughs> 5.2, 5.6 anyway. So it didn't make a whole lot of difference. Yeah. And that was the thing is I, I learned about the whole ATC, which is just don't even pay attention to ATC. I, I stopped even using the temperature probe on my on my nice Milwaukee, you know, pH meter. Because I just did, wasn't paying attention to it. Chill your work first, take your reading, and then apply what you learned to your next, your, you know, your subsequent batches. So I think that's where the importance is at. All right, next question comes from Ivar Hachim, uh, Exeth, uh, via Facebook. He says, I want to make a low ABV beer and a regular ABV beer from the same batch, but I'm unsure how it'll work with regards to the effectiveness of enzymes at different temperatures. Uh, my idea is to prepare for a two keg full volume batch. So I would guess about 10 gallons or so, uh, or 30. 38 uh, liters and take me uh, and the, uh, but it add in a, another keg's worth of water. Then I'll mash in at 78C, which is 172 Fahrenheit, and take measurements until I reach an acceptable specific gravity. For the low ABV, ABV batch, then drain off uh, one keg of volume into a separate boiler. The low ABV will then be boiled and fermented on its own. No problem. My question is, after mashing at 78C for 10 to 20 minutes, uh, will I still be able to mash at 65C, which is 149F, to achieve higher fermentability for the rest of the batch, or will the enzymes that do the work at lower temperatures already be killed off? This is a good question. It is a good question. And 
Um, I have I have two responses to this. I have kind of what the science says the the uh, the answer should be, and then I have my own experience. <laughs> so, I mean, th- if we start with the science, I mean, so we're talking about enzymes, and we're talking about the alpha amylase and the beta amylase, and they have optimal temperature ranges, right? So alpha amylase works best around 68, 72 Celsius, something like that. So 154 to 162 Fahrenheit. Beta amylase, which creates more fermentable sugars, that's more active at 60 to 65 C, so 140 to 149 F. So there is some overlap, of course, between those. But the the thing is, once you raise temperatures to a certain amount, so temperatures that say over 75 C or 167 F, they will start to denature the beta amylase, which will just greatly reduce its effectiveness. So effectively, yeah, it will kind of kill them off. So after mashing at 78 Celsius, um, yeah, which Ivar says he's doing there, it's going to significantly reduce or even completely eliminate the beta amylase activity. Um, And then dropping the temperature back down, well, it's not going to help, right? You have denatured them. They're not going to come back to life at, at that point. So in theory, it seems to me this wouldn't be the best approach to take because you are denaturing those beta amylase enzymes. That said... I sort of accidentally ended up doing this with a party guile. So I brewed an English barley wine and I mashed at 152 Fahrenheit or 67C. Um, And then I did a mash out step at 168 Fahrenheit or 70C. So that will now go through this kind of beta amylase denaturing process. Uh, But then I decided, yeah, you know what, let's do a party guile, which is basically to reuse the same mash just in a, a new batch. So I pulled out the grains seemed like there would be plenty of residual sugar still on them and remashed at that same 152 Fahrenheit. Uh, now, the second mash in the boil gave me an original gravity of 1.024, which wasn't super high, but it, I was able to extract some sugars. But I was kind of expecting, because I'd now denatured those beta amylase, those more fermentable, simple sugars, yeah. that I would see not very much attenuation. But that beer did end up attenuating down to 1.007 so either those beta amylase were able to survive that mash out step at 70c um, or they were able to come back to life a little bit i don't know but it did seem to to work out okay at least from a numbers perspective uh, from a actual sensory perspective that party girl beer was absolutely terrible absolutely <laughs> awful. So i wouldn't necessarily recommend it but it kind of worked for me so Marshall, what do you think? Are you on the science side of things or the uh, the party guile uh, experience? Well, I think the science backs up a true party guile. Uh, and and so the, the way it sounds, the way I'm reading what Ivar wrote here is that it sounds like he wants to go the opposite direction of what I would recommend, which is sort of what, uh, if you're going to do it his way, uh, kind of you're kind of saving the enzymes, right, a little bit. So I would do, if you're going to use this method, at least as I'm reading it, I would do the, the low mash temperature first as your stronger ABV beer. Uh, collect that, all of that sweet wort, do your boil, make your 5% beer that way. Um, and then I would just reuse the, 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 the mash there, those spent grains, I guess, uh, with another one. And then, um, th- but that's just a party guile. <laughs> and then, but, but you're, you, you can mash it whatever temp you want, because at that point, all you're doing is rinsing further sugar from the grains. Uh, a trick that a buddy of mine does when he is doing exactly this, he wants one stronger beer and one weaker beer or table beer. Um, what he'll do is throw in another two or three pounds of just pale malt to, and then let it sit for another hour. And he's never had issues with tannin extract or anything like that but all he's doing for that or maybe half an hour or so because we, we know you don't need a full hour for extraction or conversion um, and so you can add just a little bit more grains to your spent grains you're still going to get a lot of flavor and sugar off of those but it's not going to be as much and so you add a little bit more base malt let it sit for 20 30 minutes just for a little bit of conversion and then collect that sweet wort. The other cool little trick that you can do with this is let's say you want an IPA for your your high ABV beer, but you want something like a porter for your low ABV beer, a nice 3% porter or something. Throw in some roasted grains, add a little bit of uh, you know Munich malt, let it sit for 20, 30 minutes with that spent grain. And now you've got a nice, flavorful, completely different beer, especially if you're hopping them differently, uh, out of basically the same mash. So uh, what t- you answered Ivar's question this same exact way that I would, Martin, that it, I would suspect that if you're going to mash high and then try to go back and kind of like remash 
at a lower temperature, you've already done, first off, you've already done all the conversion you're going to do. So the temperature at that point doesn't really matter. But yes, it's already denatured those enzymes anyways. Does that make sense? Like the, the, the conversion has already occurred regardless of the temperature that he comes back in with. Yeah, absolutely. So as a general rule of thumb, when we're looking at mash temperatures, we start low and we build up. We typically don't go the other way. So if you look at a step mash, the step mash always starts at the lowest temperature and then you ramp up, up, up until you get to the, the hottest you're going to mash at. Um, you don't generally go the other way around because you are denaturing those enzymes as they, as, as they go back. So, yep, I think that's the, the approach is really to kind of approach that whole brood a little bit backwards and start with the start with the lower mash temperatures first. Okay, uh, next question is from Mitchell Jensen. And Mitchell asks, what's your preferred yeast to pitch when bottling a Lambic or an other aged sour beer? I find it very hit and miss to find yeast that works for these beers, but my preferred yeast for this is Lutrec Weich. This is one of the few stars I still bottle without touching a keg. Marshall, do you have much experience with Lambics and sour beers? <laughs> I, uh, Mitchell, first off, we appreciate your question. He submitted it as a Brew and A question, and I want to be sure to include the questions people submit. There are going to be times where our, our most honest response is, I don't really know because I don't do that. Uh, and the reality is, I, I've made plenty of sour beer over the years, but I've never bottle conditioned. Uh, I bottle conditioned one batch, but I, I uh, didn't add any extra yeast to it. I just let the microbes that were in that you know beer at the time do the fermentation, uh, re-fermentation and bottle conditioning. So I've never added yeast after the aging process for a sour beer uh, for the purpose purposes of carbonation. That being said, I have a lot of friends who for a good amount of time were into the a traditional sour beer making thing where they're letting beer sit for, you know, 6 to 18 months and then bottle conditioning and Belgian bottles and all of that. And uh, the person that I know who no longer brews, unfortunately, who made some of the best, you know, Oud Bruins and, and Flemish Reds, uh, his technique for bottle conditioning them, he would use champagne yeast uh, in the as the bottle. Condi- I don't know how much. Um, I don't think it was a whole pouch or anything, but he bought this dry uh, Lauvlin, I believe, champagne yeast, very common and would, would and it worked out really well. It wouldn't add any additional fermentation character. It fermented quickly. And I just. It, that, that's what he did, and it left a tiny, tiny layer of trube at the bottom of each bottle. That was very almost like um, if if you've ever had Sierra Nevada blue, uh, Green Label, uh, their pale ale in the bottle, and you just that tiny layer that almost stays put while you're drinking out of the bottle. That's kind of like how his. Uh, bottle fermented or bottle conditioned um, uh, sour beers were when he used this champagne yeast. And so if I were to go that route, I'd probably hit him up and ask for the exact yeast that he was using 10 years ago. Um, But that, you know, I know people also who don't use any yeast at all for their bottle conditioning and just let uh, time and and what existing microbes are in that beer kind of do their work because uh, they're you know you want to age them in the bottle as well so that that's that's my take I don't know have you ever done anything like this Martin Yeah I mean I, I have brewed one lambic and it's such an interesting experience uh, when I was brewing all the ninety nine beer styles you know lambic was one of them and of all ninety nine beers that was the only one I brewed as an extract because everything I read was like there's just no point going all grain with this you <laughs> might as well just use some LME. Uh, because that that part of it is such a minor part of the the Finnish beer character, so I ended up just taking some Bavarian wheat elemi and some Pilsner elemi and mixing it together. Uh, the other interesting thing about brewing a lambic is that you really have to have very low IBU levels in them. Uh, basically, no hop bitterness at all would be preferred. So you can buy these special hops called debittered hops, which. Are are basically zero alpha acid hops or, or pretty close to it. I ended up not having access to that. So I ended up taking a, a pound of low alpha acid hops. I think it was SARS. And I put them in a paper bag and left them at room temperature for a month. And that um, that actually well, it oxidizes them, but it also gets rid of most of the bitterness. So it was kind of kind of a really interesting style to brew. In terms of the, the yeast, f- for my Lambic, I used a, a German ale yeast. Um, and once fermentation got started, then I added in Y yeast 5526, which is a Brett yeast, which gives this kind of pie cherry sourness. And then I did the same thing as your friend there. I then, when it was time to bottle this a year later, I used some champagne yeast in those bottles. And apparently champagne yeast is very forgiving of the volatile, sour environment you're putting this thing into, you're exposing this poor yeast into. Um, And that would just give it a little bit of carbonation. It didn't do much, but then 
the style of lambic often is not very highly carbonated anyway. So it's possible you could even skip that entirely and just go with whatever natural carbonation occurred in the fermentation. Um, but yeah, I, I went with that as well. I think it's probably also worth mentioning that Imperial yeast have a, uh, a yeast strain. It's called F08. They call it sour batch, which is really good for lambics as well, which is uh, a blend of yeast. I think it's a blend of Belgian Saison and some lactobacillus and then three different Brett yeast strains. Um, but they note as well that the IBUs need to be under three in order for the lacto to work. And you'd want to condition this for something like six months. So my goodness, a lambic is a beer that requires a lot of patience. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so I understand Mitchell's concern here, you know, that this beer has been sitting here for 18 months. It's not doing anything. Yeah, there might be some bacteria in there that are that are still working to sour the beer, uh, but it, the yeast is all but puttered out. And so to ensure, you know, a, a nice carbonated finished product in the bottle, I'm going to add some yeast back in. It's a very common practice. I get that. And what yeast should I go with? I mean, if Lutra Kavike is working, Working, that that's kind of a I think that's a really clever way to do it obviously not traditional you know for for like Belgian sour ale or I don't think it would be at least uh, but if it works then just keep doing that um, I I when I would bottle condition the very rare times after I started kegging that I would bottle condition I always if I was going to add yeast back which I've only done a handful of times I always went with a dry strain because I felt it was just easier to add less and I didn't want to waste you know a package of, of uh, liquid yeast by adding just a little bit of, of it in there um, with dry yeast I would just fold the top over and then I would use that for other little experiments, uh, you know, over the following couple of months or whatever. Uh, but yeah, if Lutra Kavike is working, Mitchell, I'd say keep doing that. You might want to try some champagne yeast just to just to see if what we're talking about is complete uh, bohonkus or not. So, well, we've got to take a, a short break. When we come back, we're going to be answering more Bruin A questions. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clear wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. All righty, time to answer some more questions. Why don't you go ahead and kick us off on this round, Martin? Yeah, so the next question comes from Matthew Garber. Matthew says, I got into brewing around the end of last year and have a question that no one seems to cover well. So uh, let's see if we can cover this well, Marshall. <laughs> so he says, I have an anvil bucket fermenter with a Kolsch that's done fermenting in it. So I'm ready to cold crash it. And Matthew says, I've had luck in the past crashing while simultaneously dry hopping as the CO2 output from dry hopping typically offsets suck back in the airlock. Um, and we should say, you know, airlock suck back, that happens when the temperature drops um, with a cold crash that creates a vacuum in the fermenter. So it's could potentially pull in outside air or it can suck up all of the sanitizer from your airlock and end up in your beer as well. So it's something to be avoided. Now, Matthew says this Kolsch doesn't call for a dry hop. So that approaches out of the question. And then asks, how dangerous is it? I love any question that starts with how dangerous is it? <laughs> so how dangerous is it to just remove the airlock and plug the hole as I cold crash? I can't imagine a five gallon batch in a seven gallon vessel that the negative pressure will cause anything catastrophic. Um, well, <laughs> Marshall, what do you think? How dangerous is it? Well, I'm lucky enough to, or maybe Matthew's lucky enough that I've been around long enough to have actually 
tried this. And so I can tell you from personal experience, don't do it, man. Uh, it, I, I had the, my first round of SS Brewtech brew buckets. I think they were one of the first manufacturers or mass manufacturers at least to make uh, or market stainless uh, fermenters uh, to home brewers. And so I, I got a couple of those like 10 years ago. And I had this idea as we started getting more and more worried about cold side oxidation, particularly in hoppy beers, I thought, the same exact thing Matthew thought was there's no way the vacuum created when it's stainless steel is going to have that big of an impact. So I'm just going to plug the hole with, with a solid bung that I've got and we'll go from there. So a couple of things. First off, if, if you're reducing the temperature of that beer, it's going to create a vacuum. And at some point, no matter what, it, you're going to have to open it and that vacuum is going to be broken. And when it does, it's going to suck in air. So this was sort of why we created the balloon lock, which is really goofy way of saying a balloon that you allow CO2 to flow into at, during fermentation. And then when you're cold crashing, the CO2 from that balloon gets sucked back into the fermenter. Uh, it's it's pretty simple. It's very eloquent, but, but also rudimentary. Uh, here's the thing. What happened to my brew bucket was it completely deformed the lid. I couldn't believe it. I mean, these are stainless steel, high quality pieces of gear, and the lid no longer created a full seal on uh, the, the, the brew bucket itself. I had to actually get a new lid for, because the seal was completely broken. And it was such a small warp in the lid, but it only happened because of my plugging that bunghole. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and yeah, and, the, and that vacuum created it and, and sucked it out. So it moved it just enough, right? Warped that lid just enough so that it would suck air that was in my uh, chamber at the time. Uh, into the beer. And was it was the beer ruined? No, I think it was like a Vienna lager or something like that, but uh, it came out fine. But yeah, I would not recommend the people. It's, it's really easy to assume that, oh, it's just a 20 degree difference or whatever. It's not going to cause that strong of a vacuum. These things, these things are powerful. I mean, physics is physics, you know? Yeah. And I, I've done the same thing with PET carboys where I've just taken the, the airlock out and just plugged the hole with a bung. Uh, put it in the fridge to cold crash and then yeah it kind of like compresses in on itself yeah uh it's probably not good to do that too many times you could end up with cracks or whatnot but yeah the main issue as you say marshall is well at some point i have to take that bung out again and the vacuum has to be resolved so it's going to get some air stuck into it no matter what so i think i think there's kind of two options here i mean some of these things like the brew bucket and i'm not sure about the anvil brew bucket but they can sometimes hold just a tiny bit of pressure. Sure. So if it's safe to do so, then you can just add one or two PSI and then just prevent that negative pressure from occurring. The The alternative is if you don't want to deal with any of that or if your, your vessel doesn't support holding any pressure at all, is just skip the cold crash and proceed straight to kegging uh, if you are kegging. And then when the beer is in the keg, it's going to perform the cold crash at that stage. Now... <laughs> The first couple of pours out of that keg may not be the clearest beer you've ever had, but that's fine. It's sort of all settled to the bottom and you can then get rid of that stuff at that point. There, there, that is a point that I've been trying to, to make with people uh, as softly as I can or as gently as I can for the last 10 years that the, there's nothing magical about a cold crash. The whole purpose of cold crashing is to drop as much particulate out so that it doesn't make its way into your package. There's this weird, erroneous belief that cold crashing is what leads to clear beer. No, cold crashing contributes to clear beer, but its purpose is so that you have clearer beer and more beer, less waste, in the package. <laughs> Once you rack non-cold crashed beer to a keg and put it in a fridge, you are cold crashing. And so those few pints that you pour off after three or four days of crashing in your keg are exactly what you would have wasted anyways or left at the bottom of your fermenter. Maybe you're a couple of pints less in the keg than, than you would have been otherwise, but who cares? A cold crash is a cold crash. That beer is going to be this. So we've done experiments on this and, sh and have shown this. That beer is going to be equally as clear as if you had cold crashed in the fermenter. It's the same exact process. You don't have to, you're, you can make perfectly clear beer, just to say one more time, by skipping the cold crash step, as long as you're going to chill that beer at some point anyways. My brother was doing uh, bottle conditioning for a while. 
never cold crashed and his beers would come out absolutely crystal clear in the bottle. And you know, these are, these are naturally conditioned in the bottle. So th- there's nothing magical about the cold crash. Just remember that, uh, Matthew, I would not recommend though, just, just bunging up your, your lid and letting it, uh, do that. I would honestly, it costs like $5. You go get a Mylar balloon, take an old airlock that you have and cut off the outside plastic piece. Now you just have a nice tube, you know, use some duct tape, attach that Mylar balloon to the outside of that tube. You plug it in just like you would a normal airlock. It's going to collect a bunch of uh, CO2 and then you just reattach that. You can, you can get a clip like a bag clip or something and keep that CO2 in there or just keep it on your fermenter if you want. That's what I did is I would usually add the balloon lock, you know, two or three days into fermentation so that I wasn't overfilling it. Uh, and then cold crash with that, it never used all of the CO2 that was in there to, to, for the vacuum piece of it. And I was good to go. So that's probably the best or easiest solution. Otherwise, just skip the cold crash. So that's where we're at on that. All right. Next question comes from Tim Nichols from Margaret River, Western Australia. A bunch of Aussies writing in lately. Uh, Tim says, my question has to do with attenuation in a tropical south. This is sort of a convoluted question. So I may take some liberties here in trying to explain what Tim sent me. It was a very long email. He says, I first came across this style in one of your short and shoddy episodes, which inspired me to make it. The resulting beer was really well appreciated and over the years has won a few awards. Congrats, Tim. Uh, But one problem I've consistently had is getting it to attenuate down to where the software says it should be around 1018 FG. Lately, it stops around 1030 SG. Now, I know what you'll probably say. If it's making good beer that people like, what's the problem? Well, firstly, I want to know what the issue is. And secondly, I'd prefer, I'd personally prefer the beer to be a touch less thick and sweet. I've had no attenuation issues with other beers I make. If anything, they tend to come out drier than predicted. So this one really has me stumped. I know it's quite a complicated grain bill, but wouldn't have thought that that would cause uh, an issue as long as there's enough base malt in there. Now, Tim shared with us that his tropical stout recipe consists of 60% base malt, 10% rolled oats, 11% roasted grains, 14% specialty malts, and 5% brown sugar, which is almost 100% fermentables. He performs two separate one-hour mashes, Uh, using the brew in a bag method at 151 degrees Fahrenheit or 66 C. He then combines those words. He said he does this to ensure he hits his desired OG of 1076. His mash pH is around 5.6 and he ferments with three packs of Lau Brew Diamond Lager at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 C until it gets to about 1048 SG, at which point he lets the temperature get up to 59 F or 15 C. What do you think, Martin, might be... I mean, we're going to have to just kind of uh, spitball this a little bit, but what do you think some of the issues might be uh, that he's having that are contributing to his lack of, of I mean, complete attenuation? I, 1030 SG is pretty high. Yeah, this is a really tough one. So, Tim... I think the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this is if you invite us over to Margaret River, <laughs> Western Australia, which I just I looked on the map. I mean, it, what a cool place it looks to be. I mean, it's the absolute bottom southwest of Australia, like miles away from Perth. It sounds like a really cool place. Anyway, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, tropical stout. First thing I'll say is I don't think it's anything about the style of tropical stout that's causing this. I mean, I, I brewed a, a tropical stout. I used a different lager i used a uh, bohemian lager uh, I, my final gravity was 1.012 uh, so it came out perfectly normal uh, just looking at the the malt bill here i mean just 60 percent base malt alone that should provide plenty of enzymes for the conversion that would be needed uh, so to me the the grain bill looks okay one thing you could try is a, a step mash i mean we mentioned about these enzymes and beta and alpha amylase well the beta amylase, which will create the more simple fermentable sugars, they are more active at lower temperatures. So instead of mashing at 151 Fahrenheit, you could maybe try a step mash of first mashing a bit lower. So maybe 140 to 149 Fahrenheit, 60 to 65 C, uh, just to really make sure that we are extracting all of those sugars, especially because this is such a high gravity beer. Uh, the other thing to look at is the fermentation temperature. Now, Tim mentions that... He's using diamond lager and starting at 50 Fahrenheit 10C and then moving it up to 59 Fahrenheit 15C. I took a look. That is basically the range of this lager strain, the recommended range. Something you could try is at the end of fermentation or just as it's finishing up, trying a diacetyl rest at an even higher temperature, maybe 65 Fahrenheit or 18C. That might help 
not just with the yeast cleanup, maybe help a little bit potentially with the attenuation. But honestly, I'm looking at what you're doing here. You're saying that this isn't a problem with other beer styles that you've tried. And it doesn't seem like you're doing an awful lot wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell a little story here that I think I've told before. But uh, about 10 years ago, a good friend of mine, Sean, was having issues with attenuation, exactly like what Tim is pointing out. He'd make some beers like pale lagers or pale ales that uh, would would ferment out to normal SG or FGs. Um, you know, we're looking at 10, 12 to 10, 15, 10, 16. Nothing that was terribly worrisome, even though, you know, the, the brewing calculator might say he should have been closer to 10, 08 to 10, 10. You know, 10, 12 is fine. 10, 14, you can kind of justify that. But when he would make bigger beers like this, anything north of about 10, 65 OG, he would, they would finish somewhere around 10, 18 to 10, 25. And it was maddening for him. So for a whole year, our friend group, our brewing, home brewing friend group, were trying to diagnose this problem. And we went over and did everything that you just talked about, Martin. We, he, was, he was mashing cooler. He was doing this. He was fermenting warmer. He, we did all sorts of stuff and nothing fixed it. And then we found out, and this is the dumbest thing, his temperature or his uh, thermometer that he was using to measure his mash temperature was broken and it was measuring 12 degrees warmer than it actually or cooler than it actually was so he is overshooting and it was the same thermometer he used to test his his strike water his mash temperature so everything he was doing was 12 i think it was 12 degrees fahrenheit warmer than it should have been which means he was actually mashing if he thought he was mashing at 150 he was actually mashing at 162 well, we know for a fact that beta and alpha amylase do different things at different temperatures, and he was favoring that alpha amylase enzyme, meaning that he was he was not getting the his attenuation issues were purely a function of the fact that that wort just simply wasn't very fermentable. Did the beers taste good? Just like you're saying, Tim, they taste fine. Uh, in part because, again, experiments have shown this over and over, uh, mash temperature related attenuation issues don't seem to be very perceptible. So the thick and sweet thing may very well be a function of your bias, Tim. And I'm saying that with, with all the love in the world, it would be for me as well. It could be that your beer is going to taste exactly the same uh, even when it attenuates properly. You might want to check some of your measurement gear though. Uh, if your thermometer is old or or if you know it's, if it hasn't been calibrated in a while, it may very well be that that is your very simple issue. Give that a look because do all of the other stuff. You know, I'm with you, Martin. Those are all of the official answers that I, I stand behind as well. But also it may very well be something as simple or as stupid as a thermometer, a broken thermometer or an uncalibrated thermometer. So uh, that that's my suggestion based based purely on the experience my buddy Sean had. That's crazy. So so when the process is sound, then check your equipment. Maybe yeah. there's something wrong there. And <laughs> and the, Tim, if you're using a, a separate thermometer just for your tropical stouts, that may well, well explain what's going on here, right? So <laughs> That's not switch what that I'm... one out. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my point being though, there are certain styles, right? So if you look at his tropical stout recipe, uh, twenty, I'm looking 25%. 25% of it, of the grains he's putting in there ostensibly are either not or very, very low fermentability factors. Uh, that's a whole quarter of his grain bill. So, you know, we've, we've been able to show over and over that yes, crystal malts do ferment out on some level, a little bit at least. Uh, roasted grains, not so much. You've killed anything in there that's going to ferment anyways. So, but still 25% of, of, you know, low conversion, low sh fermentable sugar contributing grains, that may very well uh, be a part of it uh, as well. I mean, who knows? So you want to do what you can to favor that. I'm looking at my last tropical stout recipe and it looks like I went with seven, to, it's only 17%, 17 to 16 or 17 to 18% uh, crystal roasted barley. Oh no, no, not even that. God, a 12% uh, of just roasted barley and caramel malt. He's up at 25%. So that may be the issue as well. And depending on where you're sourcing those grains, it could be that they're different than the Brees and, and RAR that, you know, we're using over here. Who knows? Yeah, that makes total sense. So the fact that there are so much unfermentable stuff in here, uh, that would make it much more sensitive to any kind of temperature error in the readings. So yeah, I, th I think that's that's a solid solid thing to look at. All right, next question. I, Marshall, I don't know if this is the first time that we have a single question from two people. <laughs> brew partners, this right? Is, <laughs> right, brew partners. So we have Cam and Kat from the UK asking, I have a question, or oh, I guess they have a question about high gravity brewing and wort dilution. I'm planning to move to an all grain using a small kettle and a fermenter that will have 30 to 40% water in it. 
and they're curious if that water was mixed with malt extract to produce a very high gravity wort, could I produce the same beer if I then diluted post-fermentation into a larger keg? I'm curious, as a previous experiment had no significant result. Marshall, what do you think? So I'm a little confused about <laughs> what the process Cam and Cat are using here is. Uh, but I will say that wort dilution, uh, if you're using good water, you know, and and uh, you have decent process and you're keeping things clean, wort dilution is a completely valid way to make a, uh, a larger batch of standard strength beer or to just, you know, uh, reduce the ABV of a, of a beer that you may not, you know, be happy with or something. Um, I'm not into, again, uh, the Cam and Cat say, I'm planning to move to all grain using small kettle and a fermenter that'll have 30 to 40% water in it. So I'm thinking just under half full. Uh, and I'm curious if that water is mixed with malt extract. So my first recommendation would be you can absolutely just mix up some DME and water and ferment it. It will ferment. It doesn't need heat. I would recommend at least doing like a five minute boil just to ensure that any critters that made their way in there don't ruin your beer. But um, you could do that. And then I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, Martin. Are they talking about taking that high gravity wort and then mixing that with water to make a regular beer? Because to me, that's kind of the normal extract process, no? Or, or I mean, if you're topping up at least. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I read it as well. If it was brewing a a smaller version of a extract beer and then adding water in afterwards, which is a very common way to perform uh, these these partial volume uh, malt extract brews. Right. So it seems like that should all work okay. Uh, although just using 30 to 40% of the water. So is that then saying that 70% of the water potentially is coming after all of this? That seems like quite a lot. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, they also make mention of, of moving into all grains. So the other thought I had, and I, I think it's kind of fun to, to play around with these ideas anyway. So thank you for the question, Cam and Kat, even if we're completely missing the point. Um, moving into all grain and then keeping 30 to 40% of water in the fermenter. So are you going to make a strong all grain wort and then mix that with the water? That's exactly what we've done with our experiments and it works. Uh, just make sure you're minding your, your, you know, uh, uh, contamination and, and sanitation. You don't want to, you don't want to make a spoiled batch. Uh, you can also, the other option that I thought of in my, in my mind is what, what if they're talking about, I kind of like this idea. They're talking about taking the 30 to 40% of water from the, you know, that they're going to add to their partial boil wort to make it a five gallon batch, 19 liter batch. Uh, but what if they're talking about adding DME to the water that they're going to top it off with and then adding the actual wort from their all grain batch? So it's sort of a mixed DME all grain wort that has a higher strength because they're not blending it with they're not diluting it with water. They're diluting it with what is essentially just wort. I mean, that's kind of a fun idea if you want to make this high gravity wort. Yeah, I'd say go for it. Uh, again, I would probably boil the D or just add the DME to your wort that's on in your kettle. And then you got it all nice and mixed in and, and, and sanitized. And then you add that to the fermenter and top it up with water. Um, I don't know. Those are those are my ideas. Yeah. So come and cap, please give this a try. Let us know how it goes. We'd yeah. love to find out. <laughs> and let us work? know where we went wrong on your question. <laughs> All right, next question comes from Bryant Jorgensmeyer. He says, I'm having some trouble with my mash temperatures on a RoboBrew V2 all-in-one system. I continually have to set the temperature on the controller 7 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's around 4 to 6 C, higher than uh, the desired to hit my target mash temperature. My RoboBrew has a built-in pump as well, which I run on a very slow trickle. So before we get to his questions, just to kind of clarify, what he's saying is if he wants his mash temperature to be 150 Fahrenheit, he has to set it to between 150 57 and 110 uh, for his mash to actually be what he measures as 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So that makes sense to me. So he says, my questions are, he's got three questions related to this. One, is setting the controller temperature higher a normal course of action on all-in-one units to achieve mash temp targets? Now, I have used the SS Brutech uh, V1 or 1V for many years now, and my answer to that is no. Uh, it When I set the mash temperature and I have the pump going, recirculating, the mash just stay. I don't really do that that often because it's warm enough where I'm at that I don't lose much mash temp. 
but it it stays put when I keep it there and it aligns with my thermopens. So my answer to that on my, you know, all in one experience is the same thing with the claw hammers that I've used multiple times is it's, it, I don't have to do that, but I, I know that you, you might have a different experience, Martin. Yeah. I mean, as you say, the claw hammer system, not a, an issue at all. I don't do that, but I did have this issue with a previous brewing system I used, which was a Blickman brew easy. And that's not an all in one. That's a two vessel system. So you split the brewing water between two vessels, which are stacked on top of each other. And you have the mash in the top kettle and then the water in the, the second kettle. Uh, it all recirculates through and it goes through a controller. They call it the tower of power. Uh, and I found that if I measured the mash water coming into the top of my kettle here, uh, it was quite a bit cooler than what the controller was telling me. So I did also have to offset, not by quite as much as seven to 10 Fahrenheit, but it was by a few degrees. So I think depending on your system, uh, that can be a case where there is some temperature loss occurring. With this system, there was so much so much tubing that the, the work was flowing through uh, that it did end up with uh, some temperature loss. So that sometimes can happen. And well, and here's the, I think the more important thing is, yeah, you know, these controllers, they're not always going to be perfect. The Robo Brew is a very affordable, which is awesome system. Um, if you know that you have to go set it seven to 10 degrees higher, then who cares? Just do that until, you know, whatever you, you are aiming for, as long as you know that your, your thermometer is calibrated and accurate, uh, you know, it, it who, who, as long as that's what you know, there are on some of these controllers, you can actually go and recalibrate them as well. Um, so that might be an option for you. But I mean, if, if you know that seven to 10 degrees is what you got to do to get what you need, then just do that uh, as long as nothing is broken necessarily. Uh, his next question is what speed of recirculation do you all recommend on the all in one systems? As fast as it will go <laughs> so, with the, with the claw hammer system that I'm brewing with now, uh, I just open up that pump fully and that way I'm getting a good circulation through. So the, the work that's at the bottom of the kettle, that's where it's getting heated, that is getting passed through quickly and sprinkled back on the top. If you do have a, a kind of a slow trickle, you might not be evenly distributing the heat throughout the mash. But of course, some systems, there is a limit to how fast you, you can move through them. With my Blickman Brew Easy system, for example, I did have to be very careful about the speed that that would move in order to keep the, the two vessels with an equal amount of liquid in them. But generally, you want to get it going as fast as you can. Yeah, I, uh, again, disclaimer, I've, I've brewed many batches with pumps and recirculation. And I've found that on my scale, when I'm making a six gallon batch of beer, the recirculation is just a pain in my ass. So I stopped doing that and I would just stir uh, every, you know, every 10 to 15 minutes, gently stir the mash and that would keep the temperature well distributed and never had issues with that. Um, but again, I, I would, I was with you when I was recirculating my wort, not only would I go full bore and open the valve all the way, cause you want that movement. I always tried to use as little tubing as possible so that it was the, that wort was out of the mash for the least amount possible of time. And I would poke the, and I'm not a Lodo brewer, but I would poke the, uh, tubing uh, I know, I know this, you can't do this on the claw hammers because they have the, the valve on the top that kind of sprays the wort over the top of the mash. Um, but I would put the tubing into the top of the mash so that it, there was, it wasn't splashing too much, but that was just the, the way I did it back then. This is like eight, nine, 10 years ago, something like that. Uh, now the, you know, Bryant's third question, I think brings everything together and it seems to suggest that uh, he may be wondering if there is a, if his mash temperature issues are a function of his recirculation speed. So he says, could I run a faster recirculation and a lower controller temperature to achieve the desired mash temperature? So from what we're saying then, clearly, yes, you could. But I do think, you know, Marshall, you mentioned there of not recirculating at all would be a pretty interesting test here is to, to just try this with a brew where actually you don't recirculate. You just turn on the, the temperature controller, you have it set whatever the temperature is, and then you measure the mash temperature over time without recirculating and maybe just give, you know, give the mash a stir every yeah. 10 minutes or so um, and see if you still have to do that seven to 10 Fahrenheit offset. Cause I suspect you 
possibly won't need to unless there is a problem with actually the temperature measurement that is occurring in your system. Well, and, and that's the thing. So anybody who's brewed on a an electric system that has an element or whatever, it, a specific area of the kettle that is heating your mash or your wort, whatever it might be, you know that there's going to be some very, very quick stratification of, of heat. Um, and that's because whatever's closest to the element is going to be warmer than whatever's furthest away from it. And that's why I stir. It's also why there's recirculation, which people will contend that recirculation also contributes to better conversion efficiency and all of that as well. Um, but in my experience, that wasn't the issue. For me, it was keeping the the temperature of the entire mash the same. And since I'm a stirrer, <laughs> I, uh, I, I found that that is far more efficient for me than running a pump that I got to worry about cleaning that also exposes that wort uh, to outside air, which is going to cool it off a little bit more. And uh, to me, it was just a hassle. Um, so yeah, I'm with you, Martin. Give it a shot, Bryant. Uh, uh, just not using your recirculation at all and stirring it every five to 10 minutes. And the other thing that I did is I wouldn't, I, I wasn't a fan of just leaving the element on because I'm neurotic and I worried about <laughs> scorching my mash. Um, and so what I would do again, I live where it's pretty warm throughout the year, uh, especially in my garage. And so, uh, what I would do is turn the element on, get it to my mash temperature that I want, but then I'd go like three degrees warmer, uh, Fahrenheit warmer, which is only like a one and a half degrees warmer than Celsius. And I gave myself this window. If I'm at, if I'm aiming for 150 and I start at 153 by the end in the summertime, by the end of, you know, uh, an hour long mash, I'm, I'm going to be down to 150. That's no big deal, but I'm stirring the whole time. In the winter time, it might drop down to 148, at which point I'll I'll turn on my uh, element really low, give it a good stir until it reach it gets back I'll stir continuously until it gets back up to that 152 153. I turn off the element again and I let it sit and gently stir every 5 10 minutes uh, until the end of the mash. And that worked for me. Uh, again, there's a lot of forgiveness in the in a couple of Fahrenheit, you know, degrees Fahrenheit differences in mash temp. You're not going to you're not going to taste the difference. Um, it might affect your attenuation a little bit, but that range is so small, I doubt you're even going to notice it. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Martin? Yeah, I, th I think that's that's a solid way to go. So um, yeah, a few things to try there, but I think in general, if you're using these all-in-one systems and you are recirculating, get them going as quickly as you can. And if it does mean that there is some sort of temperature offset, as long as you know that that's the case, dial it in, you're good. I don't think there's anything to worry about there. Yeah. Okay, so final question this is a, a fun one from jeremiah picard who says if you could sit down for a pint with any philosopher dead or alive who would it be what would you ask them marshall i really want to hear your answer to this but i'm just going to go first because because okay. <laughs> you're going to have a much better answer than me i know so <laughs> i i actually sat down and asked my family about this yesterday like uh, I don't know any philosophers. I, I think I've got a reasonably good one, which is Hildegard von Bingen, who was a 12th century abbess, which is a head of a, an abbey of nuns. Um, she was a writer, a composer, and a philosopher. And she was born near where currently Frankfurt, Germany is. And she was probably the first person to describe hops in a scientific manner. So in her book, Physica. She described the preservation qualities of hops when it really was not a commonly known thing at that point when added to the beer. Um, but she also noted how the hops could increase melancholy, you know, a feeling of sadness. So, so what I would want to do is if Hildegard was around today, I'd like to ask her what level of melancholy she experiences from today's milkshake IPAs. <laughs> God. <laughs> Marshall, how about you? <laughs> this is a really tough question for me because I, I mean, brewlosophy got its name in part from my love of both beer and philosophy. Uh, and I feel like uh, I can't just name one. And thankfully, Jeremiah didn't limit us to just one. She said, if he said, if you could just sit down for a pint with any philosopher, well, mine is going to be three people. Uh, and some of them may not be what others would term, you know, technical philosophers, but in my mind, you know, uh, that they are, they, they had their philosophies of life of the human condition and stuff. So the first one I'm going to say is a modern philosopher who happens to still, if I'm not mistaken, still be alive today. He's getting quite old. His name is Sam Keen. Uh, he wrote 
a book called Fire in the Belly that I thought was great. He's written many other books that I've also read, but Fire in the Belly, which is incredible. And uh, he, he has, he's one of the few who, um, who has kind of uh, popularized this idea, for example, of uh, a saying that I love of his or a quote is that resentment is a poison that I take in the hope that it kills somebody else, right? And that concept and his uh, way of thinking about life and human interactions and interpersonal connections is something that has influenced the hell out of me in the way that I approach other people. Um, not not to say that I worship the guy. I certainly don't. Um, in fact, he has some really fascinating uh, uh, books and writings on religion and spirituality and all of that that I find quite valuable as well. So Sam Keen is still alive. He also, uh, uh, which I find fascinating, uh, is was a uh, uh, hobbyist trapeze artist, <laughs> which I think is kind of cool. He, uh, he like built a trapeze thing in his backyard at one point, I believe, back when he was still able to do those types of things. And for those who want to hear him talk or at least uh, uh, get some ideas from him, he was featured on my favorite, absolute favorite documentary of all time called Flight from death, the quest for immortality. I believe you could find it for free on YouTube right now. Absolutely phenomenal look at uh, the human condition and the things that make us tick. Now, that was a long-winded answer for my number one. My number two is, this is the one that's going to make me sound like a nerd and everybody's probably expecting me to say it, but I want to sit down and pick Nietzsche's brain so much. Uh, so many of the things that that people uh, you know, attribute to Frederick Nietzsche uh, are things that I look at and I'm like, I don't know if they're interpreting that the way that I did. For example, in Thus Spake Zarathustra, one of the most popular things that Nietzsche has ever written was the the simple, you know, three-word line, God is dead. Now, yes, he he was a, a, a an advocate of free thought and not being, you know, married to these religious thoughts where other people are brainwashing you to believe the things that you believe in, yada, yada. But I don't think <laughs> when he made that comment that what he was trying to say was, or, or he wasn't trying to piss people off and saying that your God is dead, you guys are dumb. I think what he was saying is that as a society, as a culture of human beings, we have advanced to the point of no longer requiring this idea of, of God uh, to keep us in order and to keep us good. We have... Uh, capacities to do that on our own without the mysticism piece of it anymore. And I want to sit and ask him if I'm right on that or if, the, or if he really was just being a dick, you know, and saying it out loud to piss people off. Finally, my, and also there's so many other things I would sit and chat with him about. He kind of went mad at the end of his life. I think it'd be fun to see that side of it as well, uh, given what I do for a living. Um, but the other person that I would, and I'm going to call him a philosopher, even though he was really a psychiatrist, uh, was back in the, I believe the 50s to the 70s, uh, another uh, uh, Fritz Perls, whose name was also Friedrich, uh, but Fritz Perls was his associate. He's the guy who's behind the Gestalt movement um, in psychology, and he is one of the most fascinating people in this field. Uh, in part because of his personality and his approach, I feel like he he focused really heavily on being genuine and not letting our concerns and our ego, as it were, get in the way of us being who we really are. And um, the stuff he did with 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 dreams and um, his way of thinking about, again, human interactions and what that means, I think it would be really interesting to, to be able to sit down with him and have a chat <laughs> because I, I, I find myself constantly uh, referring back to stuff that I've read from Fritz uh, and thinking, man, I, you know, I relate with this guy on many levels, uh, and particularly in terms of congruence and, and being real and the person that you are in every situation possible uh, so that you're not spinning anybody in the wrong direction. But those are my three. You got Nietzsche, Fritz Perls, uh, and Sam Keen. If the four of us could get together at a pub and spend like four hours shooting the shit, I would absolutely pay to do that. So, Well, <laughs> Jeremiah, you could not have asked Marshall a more perfect question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we appreciate all the questions that everybody asked on this episode, as we always do. That is all the time that we've got for our, our 340th episode. What the hell? I can't believe it. Uh, again, thanks to everybody for uh, sending in those questions. We couldn't do this if you guys didn't do that. If we didn't get to a question that you've submitted, uh, it is likely on the list that we're going to answer in future Brew and A episodes. And if you have a question, uh, you can send an email to feedback at brewlosophy.com, making sure to indicate that it is for Brew and A in the subject line. So we're sure to add it to that list. Uh, please don't forget to check out the Brew Lab podcast where host Kate Job takes you into the lab with brewing professionals to discuss the fascinating work they've done on our favorite beverage. And make sure to head to brewlosophy.com to read up on all the fun beer and brewing stuff we are up to. 
The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man. No-